a few years ago, I can't really remember how many years ago because when you're my age, life slips by quite quickly. Maybe five years ago, maybe 10 or 20, or perhaps 100 or so, I can't really remember now. Um, I got involved in working uh, for tourism for a country. And since then, I've become very interested in the whole issue of the nation and the brand. And what I wanted to talk about today a bit was this issue of the nation and the brand and the nation as a brand. And I know that you in South Africa, for a whole variety of reasons, have been rather concerned with the way South Africa has received in the world, in Africa and in the world in general. And I thought a few observations around countries other than South Africa, and maybe South Africa itself might be uh, entertaining. Um, when you think of a country, any country, you think of it, uh, we just heard uh, Alistair talking about the various Guays, Panaguay and Paraguay and Uruguay and any other Argentine Guay and so on and so forth. When you think of these uh, countries, when you think of any country, you think of it in a very, um, a very odd and very disconnected kind of form. So, if, for instance, if I start talking, if we start thinking of France, we might think, let's say, of luxury products, or we might think of food, we might think of restaurants, or we might think, let's say, of holidays, or we might think of very considerable engineering achievement, or we might think of art, Degas, Renoir, ballet, whatever it might be. We might think of a few odd politicians that happen to be French, like uh, de Gaulle or Chirac, or maybe now Sarkozy and Royal who are competing, or so maybe we don't think about Chirac at all. Uh, <laughs> or maybe we think about a few riots and things we read about in the newspaper or saw on the screen uh, a year or so ago. In other words, we, we kind of have an idea about France in a sort of vague sort of way. Uh, just as it might be people living in the United States or Australia or Great Britain or France, for that matter itself, might have an idea about South Africa in a vague kind of way. And those of you who've traveled abroad, and I guess most of you have, must have found rather irritated the confusion that people have in their minds between South Africa and Africa and Johannesburg and Cape Town and Nairobi. It's all over there somewhere. So we have these ideas in our head. Let's say we have an idea in our head for the sake of the argument about Italy, which is to do with luxury and glamour and Lamborghini and Ferrari and Gucci and so on and so forth. Or maybe a bit of Berlusconi is added in. So uh, an airline, an Italian airline, wants to advertise in, let's say, Great Britain. And the Italian airline happens to be Alitalia, which is arguably the world's worst airline. <laughs> now, actually, when I come to think about it, it isn't arguably at all, nothing to argue about. It is the world's worst airline. So what can you say about Alitalia if you happen to be a British advertising agent trying to persuade people to go uh, fly Alitalia? Only something about how incredibly attractive Italians are <laughs> So, with a bit of luck, you might get shacked up with that chap in the lavatory. <laughs> it's a funny old way to think about a country when you think about it. Or there are other situations, there are other places we know of where we don't know the country at all. All we know about is the, is the brand that comes from the country. So, we have, let's say, Samsung. Now, how many, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I guess there aren't very many people in this room who know anything about Korea apart from... Samsung and Hyundai and Kia, one or two other names. You may know that the capital city of South Korea is Seoul. Let's think. Does anybody know, hands up, anybody know any other city in South Korea apart from, no, don't put your hands up because you don't know. <laughs> so it isn't necessarily the case, though, that we always associate the nation and the brand. So many people in so many countries, the countries I work with, for example, say, well, we can't make ourselves known in the world because we haven't got any worldwide brands. We haven't got any well-known brands. Fine, that may be true. But it's also true that there are plenty of worldwide brands where people don't know much about the nation they come from. Samsung is an example of this. On the other hand, you do get situations, and this is one of them, where certain types of product are so very, very closely associated with the nation that you cannot separate them at all. So Scotch whiskey is Scotch, and if, for the sake of the argument, it happened to be Italian whiskey, 
just let's say it wouldn't, kind of wouldn't taste so nice. So there are these issues, or putting it another way, there's olive oil which comes from Italy or Greece or Spain or somewhere, and if it was Scottish olive oil, <laughs> well, I don't know, it sort of doesn't seem right somehow. So there are these issues, and they're quite complex. So the, the certain types of product, um, uh, wine, for example, is so closely associated with a nation, with a country, with a particular country, that it even has, in some cases, particular associations with the region. So great Europhiles and Eurocrats in my part of the world don't think necessarily that Euro wine would go down a bomb. It would be not necessarily the most um, um, successful kind of product you could have. Then again, we have all kinds of associations with countries which relate to what they were like 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years ago and not what they are like now. So one of the reasons why nations are very anxious to project an idea of themselves and quite a lot of what I do in my life is to do with working with countries trying to see how they can project an idea of their reality, not what people thought of them today in relation to what they were 30 years ago, but what people thought of them today in relation to what they are today. This problem between the reality, uh, which is uh, way, way, way ahead of the image, affects all kinds of nations. And one of the nations it affects is, and you only have to look at this picture to see, that this is Brazil. Now, one of the things about Brazil, of course, is samba and knocking people off in the streets and facelifts and so on and so forth. But it also happens that there is a relationship between this aircraft and Brazil. This aircraft is the primary trainer, primary training aircraft for the Royal Air Force, and it's built in Northern Ireland and Belfast by a company called Shorts. So what the hell's that got to do with Brazil? Only that Shorts is owned by Bombardier, which is a French-Canadian company, and this aircraft, which is called the Tucano, is built under license from Embraer, which is the fourth largest aircraft manufacturer in the world. So our idea, so a Brazilian aircraft is used by pilots in the Royal Air Force to learn to fly on. So our ideas about Brazil can be a bit confused. Equally, our ideas about, let's say, India can be a bit confused too. In fact, our ideas about lots of places can be a bit confused, and I dare say that the world's idea about South Africa is also a bit confused. What do they think, people say to me, if I go to somewhere like Lithuania, what do they think of Lithuania? The answer is very simple, they don't. <laughs> what do they think of South Africa? Well, it's kind of over there somewhere. Um, in some cases. In some cases it's better known, in some cases it isn't better known. Of course there are plenty of organizations that don't associate themselves. I don't know, do you have Orange, the mobile phone company here? I'm not sure. I can't remember whether you do or you don't. It's, they, uh, my natural modesty inhibits me from mentioning the name of the branding company that created this uh, <laughs> mobile phone company, but it has been astonishingly and delightfully successful but it doesn't appear to come from anywhere. And there are many, many, many products and services that don't appear to come to some, from anywhere, as well as the ones that do. But some of the ones that do find themselves in slightly embarrassing situations. This is an Apple computer, which, as you can see, is de designed by Apple in California, as you see here, but it is assembled in China, as you see here. So there are all kinds of issues around lots of companies where the national sense of origin is regarded as part of the power of the brand itself. Another example of this is German engineering, made in Germany by Turks, or made in Turkey by Turks, depending what you feel like. I became very interested in this subject a few years ago, and my former company at that time, we did a series of studies on made in. What does made in mean? So we did made in Germany, we did made in France, we did made in Italy, and we did made in Britain. And in order to find out what people thought, we did a series of interviews uh, with the Financial Times. It was a joint program, and we studied about 200 people. We talked to about 200 people 
who were senior buyers. They were senior people buying things, purchasing directors in companies all over the world. And we asked them a series of questions. What do you associate with made in Germany? What do you associate with made in Britain? And so on and so forth. Now, these were not people who came off the street. These were people who were actually involved in the process of buying things, purchasing things, and they were decision takers. I'll just show you one or two of the results now. Made in Germany. So we asked people who were doing these kinds of jobs in these kinds of companies, what do you associate with the idea of made in Germany? So which industries do you associate with Germany? 50% said automotive, 30% light and heavy engineering, and so on right down to financial services, consumer goods, how many people, what do you associate with Germany in terms of financial services? 2%. So poor old Deutsche Bank, which is one of the largest organizations of the world, forget about it, even your name is a bit funny. Or SAP, which is one of the largest software companies, well, they go to very considerable lengths to kind of imply without quite saying so, as they said, not really German at all, they're American. But they're not American, they are German. Uh, which image do you associate with made in Germany? Technical prowess, 100%, quality, reliability, engineering, progressive, value for money, and so on and so forth. Emotional, technical prowess, 100%, emotional, none, nil. Absolutely nobody associates. So, Hugo Boss, forget about it. And as for Jill Sander, this is emotion, obviously, she just hasn't, doesn't happen to wear any clothes at the moment, not emotional at all. So these kinds of companies go to enormous lengths to separate themselves from the values of the nation from which they originally derive. And these are very major issues in marketing terms, overall branding terms. So in general, I won't go into the made in UK, made in France, made in Italy, but you get similar kinds of distortions, grotesque distortions, nothing to do with the reality, all kinds of myth and so on and so forth. So what is our idea? What, well, broadly speaking, is our idea of Germany all over the world? It's kind of Lederhosen, Mercedes-Benz, and Adolf Hitler all mixed up. <laughs> it changed a bit at the World Cup. It changed a bit at the World Cup because at that time, Germany, for the first time, began to feel Germans began to feel quite proud that they behaved well, that it was a focus of attention, uh, and that most of the people who visited Germany thought that it was a very good place to be. So there was a shift. How permanent that shift will be, one doesn't know, but there was certainly a shift. And these kinds of big events do have a cataclysmic effect on the longer term. So what is the image, then, of what is the, how do we perceive, then, the most important country in the world? How do we perceive the United States? How is the United States perceived worldwide? Well, it's a very, very, very curious mixture of things. Very curious mixture. There are four or five or maybe 10 or 20 strands, but there are four really key important strands that emerge out of America. And one of them is this enormous opportunity that you can do anything in America, you can go to America, you can, be, you be, you can become anything in America, because America has the most staggering opportunity. So, land of opportunity and all that, associated partly with, and this is the second um, uh, strand, I guess, associated partly with the extraordinary success of technology. I mean, the whole of the technological world, it, this is Andy Grove of Intel, who happened to be a Hungarian immigrant. Many of the people who run the biggest businesses, the biggest IT businesses, in the world, in California, in Silicon Valley, <coughs> are Chinese or Indian or maybe South African. In the case of uh, Andy Grove, he happens to be Hungarian. So <coughs> you've not only got this fantastic opportunity, you can do anything, the chances for you to do anything are vast, you've also got this extraordinary ability uh, to have technical, absolute technical superiority over everyone, everywhere, at any time. The third strand is what you might call seductive, demotic junk that we can't stand and we hate and clutters up our high streets, but nevertheless it is so seductive that we love it. So we love it and we hate it, and it's McDonald's and Coke and Hollywood and all the other stuff that is all over the world, all over everywhere, and we kind of love to hate it and do it. And the fourth strand, I guess, which is relatively new, is Guantanamo Bay and all of the... Um, 
what is regarded as the imperialist excesses uh, of the United States as it is today. So you've got these four strands all mixed up. There are other strands as well, but you've got these four strands all mixed up, and that is the reason why people's attitudes towards America are so confused and confusing. I saw a study the other day which was carried out in Cairo <coughs> amongst um, the inhabitants of Cairo about the United States. Which country in the world do you most hate? America. Question two. Question 12. Which country in the world would you most like to live in? America. Fine. <laughs> are you surprised? I'm not. It's not surprising, because the messages that, these, that this country sends out are so incredibly conflicting, they are so confused, they are so paradoxical, and they are ultimately so contradictory. In the last 15 years, there have been 29 new countries, or putting it in marketing terms, the market is getting a bit crowded. It's getting very crowded indeed. I won't embarrass you by asking you how many of the names of these flags you know. I know that all of you know all these flags. Well, you may know all these flags, but the US State Department doesn't. So, for example, on the top, the third on the left happens to be the flag of one country called Slow something or other, and the second one, second down, is another flag of another country called Slow something or other. One's Slovakia, and the other one's Slovenia. And just to confuse the issue, they're both white, blue, and red. They've both got a little shield in the middle. And just to confuse the issue further, Slovakia in Slovak is called Slovenska, which sounds quite Slovenia, like, quite like Slovenia. Well, that confused the US State Department, so they sent a mission to Slovenia instead of Slovakia. <laughs> or maybe it was Slovakia instead of Slovenia. Whatever it was, it was the wrong one. And surprise, surprise, they were quite annoyed when they got there. I mean, the people were quite annoyed. So, this is an issue that confuses people and helps people. I mean, some of these flags are really, um, they're quite difficult to know if you're not, I mean, they're quite difficult to be familiar with if you're not familiar with the countries. In addition to all that, there's the United Nations, there's Mercosur, there's the European Union. So, you're getting an enormous pull in one direction for globalization, for massive regionalization, and another pull in another direction for the development of new small countries, Africa is not immune from this, Central Asia is not immune from this, and so on and so forth. This is, of course, as you all know, everybody here, I don't even have to say which country this is the flag of, because you all know it anyway, don't you? Don't you? Well, this is the Basque country, which is not, of course, a country yet, it's a region, except it doesn't think it's a region, it thinks it's a country, and so on and so forth. All of which makes the issue of branding the nation a very real one. And there are, in, re in reality, I guess, four reasons why most nations, including your nation, including South Africa, are concerned about how they should project an idea of themselves on the world. And the four reasons are foreign direct investment, brand export, tourism, and public diplomacy. If you are competing with 129 or 259 other nations for foreign direct investment, for export, and for tourism, and if public diplomacy affects that issue, if you can somehow or other make these coherent, make these efforts coherent, then you can attract more foreign direct investment or more tourism, more export, and you can get richer and also you can become more influential. Thank you very much. So, are these things as simple as all that? Is tourism just, for example, sun, sea, and sand? Well, last night it was certainly, there was lots of sun and there was quite a lot of sea and there was quite a lot of sand as well in the place that we happen to be in Cape Town, but as we all know, parts of South Africa are not sun, sea, and sand, and a great deal of tourism that one is involved with is no longer sun, sea, and sand tourism. Because in a sense, sun, sea, and sand are now commodities. If you can sell it in one place for 100, you can sell it for 80 in another place. If you can sell it for 80 in another place, you can sell it for 60 somewhere else. So people go because people are getting, <coughs> all over the world, getting a bit richer, because there are opportunities for traveling very many miles for very many hours to go to very interesting places. 
issues around tourism are no longer to do necessarily only with sun, sea and sand, but they are to do with all kinds of things, package tours, study abroad, backpacking, mice, which is exhibitions, conferences and so on, sporting events, adventure holidays, nature excursions and so on and so forth. In other words, tourism becomes a quite interesting marketing commodity. I go somewhere for food tourism or architectural or cultural tourism. I want to define my country in terms of the culture, the theatre or whatever it is that it offers. So tourism again becomes a quite complex issue. Foreign direct investment is not simply necessarily manufacturing cars. Foreign direct investment is also an issue to do with <clears throat> where do I put a plant, where do I put an R&D activity. Uh, if I'm going to put an R&D activity, so research and development activity somewhere, am I going to go somewhere where there are rational advantages like tax, like good education and so on. I also want to go somewhere where I can uh, have a nice home, have a nice climate and uh, uh, have a nice place for my family to grow up. There's an issue, let's say, between tourism and foreign direct investment. People think of these things as different. In, dif in government, foreign direct investment is run by one ministry, tourism is run by another ministry. But if I visit South Africa and like it so much that I decide to buy a holiday home here, is that tourism or is that foreign direct investment? In other words, the overlap between all of these issues between tourism, between foreign direct investment, between export and the other two are very, very complex and most governments do not understand how closely these relationships are and they do not understand how to manage these relationships. If you start looking at the issue of brand export, it isn't simply sending wine abroad or sending a finished product abroad. It can be manufactured goods, it's shoes, but it can be people. It can be athletes, it can be professors, it can be the arts, it can be painting, it can be sport, it can be all kinds of things. So when you begin to start looking at the way a country influences the world, when you start looking at the way a country influences its neighbours, it influences the world as a whole, there are all kinds of factors, let's say to do with sport, to do with culture, to do with uh, the people who live in the country, to do with all kinds of issues which are other than the kinds of products that we manufacture. And then there's one final issue which is again extremely important and that's what you can call public diplomacy or if you like soft power and that is to do with the way a country is perceived because of how it behaves. And the most dramatic example of that occurred here in South Africa where 20 years ago or so Attitudes to South Africa changed totally when the government changed and when everything in South Africa seemed to be quite different from what it was before. If you look, there are many other examples. If you look at Ukraine three or four years ago at Christmas, there was a revolution in Ukraine. Suddenly, people began to notice that a country called Ukraine existed. It had been there before. It had 60 million people and was a very big country before. Suddenly, it began to exist. So suddenly people began to think, maybe we can invest there, maybe we can visit there, maybe there are things to do there. So Ukraine begins to get on the map. Now if you put these things together, if you put together tourism and foreign direct investment and brand export and public diplomacy, what you have is an incredibly complex mix. And when you're talking about public diplomacy, you're not talking about individuals only. You're talking about events, event exhibitions, you're talking about, for example, the design in Darba, which will inf have influenced many foreigners who are themselves quite influential. Many people from abroad will come here, will be in this room today, will come back from South Africa saying things about South Africa that they wouldn't have said before because it's influenced them. So this event that we're involved with now, in now is part of the soft diplomacy of South Africa, whether it is aware of it or whether it isn't. In fact, I know <coughs> that it is aware of it, very aware of it. So events, ex ex exhibitions, cultural institutions, festivals, all of these kinds of things, the way you behave as a, as a nation affects the way the nation is seen. Now, with all this going on, how can the nation manage its image? How can it have a strong brand? My observation is that almost every nation I've been involved with and talked to, and there have been very many, 
want to do something about this. They want to be seen and perceived and understood. They want to be liked. They want investment. They want influence. Uh, they want tourism. They want all these things. They all want all these things. They want, in other words, a strong brand because it is valuable to them. But at its best, at its really uh, most powerful, a national brand can help people both inside the nation and, and outside the nation to understand what it is. It can provide a headline for a number of different and attractive stories. It can work for a multiplicity of audiences and for a multiplicity of economic sectors, not just tourism, because they, as I tried to explain, they overlap. It has to have emotion behind it and it has to have truth behind it and above all, it has to be unique. It has to be unique. Well, that is where the whole thing tends to fall down. How many nations, regions, places brand themselves discover? Or brand themselves a land of contrasts? How many lands of contrasts are there? Here are a few lands of contrasts. Here are a few more lands of contrasts. And here are a few more lands of contrast. 69 plus at the last count. So is South Africa a land of contrast? You bet it is. Together with the 69 other places. You have to find out what it is you are. You have to find out how you can use what it is you are in a way that is unique. And you have to be prepared to understand that there are warts and all, that it is not all lovely, and you cannot pretend it is lovely. In any nation, it is not all lovely, and that's where the problem lies. The problem lies with people who insist on presenting a front which is so bland that it ends up exactly the same as everybody else's front. Let's just have a look at some brand and tourism slogans. These happen to be European because that's the area of the world that I know best. So you have the essence of Europe, the heart of Europe, the cool country with a warm heart, the small country with a big heart, the green piece of Europe, what about the big country with a small heart? We haven't got that one. And the center of Europe. Except that they didn't come from where I said they came from, they came from the others, but it didn't matter because they're completely interchangeable anyway. Malawi, I noticed the other day, is the heart of Africa, just like Poland is the heart of Europe or something. Now, all this stuff, this pap, doesn't get you anywhere, and neither do the visual images that go with it. The visual images that go with it are also pretty much mutually interchangeable. Mutually interchangeable. Getting it right demands clarity, emotion, style, authenticity, coordination, and an idea. And it also demands, in terms of authenticity, that you accept that not everything is perfect. There have been a few countries who've done it. Uh, New Zealand, I think, has managed it very well. New what New Zealand did, I, haven't in I wasn't involved in any way in the New Zealand program, but as far as I can judge from a distance, what New Zealand has done and said uh, is that we will take the obvious disadvantage of being so far away from everything that we are remote and turn that into an advantage by calling it pure. I mean, that's an over grotesque oversimplification, but there is something in it. That is what they have done. Of course, it's a beautiful country. There are lots of beautiful countries, but it is a very, very, very long way away from anywhere. Even from Australia, it's three and a half hours. And they've said, they've turned it round. They've turned the remoteness into the idea of pure. And I think it's been done very well and very consistently and over a very long time. I'm saying that as an outsider because I haven't been involved in it, but to me it looks good. We are currently, in my, com in my company, working on an image program for Poland, which I have got some material on here, but I can't show it to you now because I haven't got time. But it's a, also a very long and complicated issue. But what I want to show you is one that I think has been very successful, which with, with which I have been, a program with which I have been involved, which has been very successful. And it's been run in an extraordinarily informal and um, very unusual kind of way. And that's Spain. In 1975, 
Spain was uh, a poverty-stricken autocracy, totalitarian state that nobody went to except if you hadn't got <coughs> very much money, you went there for a bit of sun, sea, and sand because it was cheap. And Spain, images of Spain were really collapsing. It was to do with, for example, flamenco dances. It happens that I go to Spain every, this was a classic image of Spain at the time and still is in some ways. Uh, I go to Spain every two or three weeks because we have an office there and I have never in the whole of my life seen a woman dressed like that, ever. <laughs> but there you are. Um, so this is what Spain looked like more or less in 1975. And then there came a program, and I guess the summation, the summary of that is the Juan Miro symbol, symbol and various, different, various people did different jobs in Spain, and I was involved, we were involved in some of them. And this was, you've seen this picture, and this is that same company today. What we were trying to do was to, to take various major ideas around Spain, to do with culture, to do with sport, to do with corporations to do with tourism and project them as very Spanish, very passionate, but, to, but having the kinds of qualities uh, that the very best competitors would have anywhere in the world. So Repsol, which is a Spanish petrol company, looks and looked very Spanish, was made to look very Spanish, but was seen to be absolutely as good as, in every conceivable respect, uh, ExxonMobil or BP or Shell or Caltex or anybody else you can mention. So everything we looked at was to do with it around the idea of passion but making it internationally competitive. And over a period of time, nobody told Almodovar what kind of films to make, but the kinds of films he made, the kind of culture that that represented, was an idea around Spain. And there were these major exhibitions in Spain. There was the Sevilla, there was the Barcelona Olympics. And all of these things gradually began to turn the idea of Spain around. Huge individual architectural accomplishments. And this is Frank Gehry's uh, Guggenheim in Museum in Bilbao, which had been a struggling, rather straggly, useless port town which was dying. And Bilbao rebuilt itself around the Frank Gehry idea. Interestingly, Gehry is not as you all know, a Spaniard, he is a Californian, or he certainly works in California, uh, and whether or not the work you do all comes from the country of origin, uh, or is all done by people from that country, is not the issue, because we, we, we live in a world where the idea of importing people from abroad is good. It makes, it makes the country seem more international and more open. So the Geary stuff in, and the Foster stuff, for that matter, in Bilbao was very good for Bilbao, very good for um, the Basque country, and very good for Spain. And then gradually you began to get major international manufacturers appearing. Seat, which had previously been a kind of broken down um, example uh, of a, a Fiat, product which nobody wanted, so they built it in Spain, suddenly turned when Volkswagen took it over into a major competitor. And in every sphere you look, you see this happening again and again and again. Uh, this is an advertisement which is produced just a few months ago, absolutely nothing to do with, I mean, I just happened to see it in a newspaper about a Spanish <coughs> beer. So what you have now is a way of looking at the country through a lens which has been made very clear, and the ideas around that are shared in every conceivable activity you can think of. The one area where Spain is not yet known uh, very well around the world is in its technological expertise, and we're currently working uh, with the major te Spanish technological company and the Spanish government on projecting the idea of Spanish technology, which is rather specific to do with signaling and wind power, all kinds of other things. Um, so the, the image of Spain, which you see in cultural terms, in sporting terms, Real Madrid and so on, uh, in terms of tourism, will also move in terms of technology. So it is seen to be, within the next five years, I guess, uh, a very modern and sophisticated technological country, as being all of these other things. Well, I have, there are lots of other pictures I could show, but I won't because time is running out and all that kind of thing. I'll stop now, and if any of you, if that suits the sponsors here, if any of you have any questions uh, that you'd like to raise, if we've got time now, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, maybe we can talk at some other time. Thank you very much.